When a new comic character takes up a previously established identity, they tend to be similar to their predecessor. Both Peter Parker and Miles Morales were bitten by radioactive spiders and more or less have the same powers. Barry Allen and Wally West were both struck by lightning during a science experiment, and now they go fast. But the interesting thing about the title of Ms. Marvel is that even though Kamala Khan has leapt into mainstream notoriety as the character, she is far from the first person to take up the mantle. In fact, there have been four Ms. Marvels over the years, and half of them were villains. But on top of that, each of them has a completely different power set, which in my opinion makes the mantle of Ms. Marvel one of the most interesting legacy identities in all of comics. So of course, I did what I always do on this channel. I read decades worth of comics to present what I found in one easy to digest video. Let's jump in. But you know what's also easy to digest? Today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. You guys have heard me talk about them non-stop, and that is for good reason. Well, I mean, for one, they pay me. But also, it's a legitimately healthy cereal that's become a huge part of my life. Having always been a huge fan of sugary cereal, switching to Magic Spoon has just been great for me, since it has 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, 4 net grams of carbs, and it's only 140 calories per serving. They're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free, and low-carb, without skimping on any of the flavor. Seriously, I demolish boxes of the maple waffle flavor left and right, but I also change it up from time to time with flavors like cinnamon and blueberry. If you don't believe me, then try it for yourself by going to magicspoon.com slash drake and using my code drake for $5 off a variety box of your very own. That ships to the US, Canada, and the UK. And if you don't like it for any reason, the Magic Spoon will give you a 100% cashback happiness guarantee, no questions asked. There is a reason why these guys are my all-time favorite sponsor, but as much as I can keep going on and on and on, it's time to get back to the video. So back when she was first created in 1968, Carol Danvers was simply a love interest for Marvel's newest hero, Captain Marvel. A guy who they literally made just so they could prevent DC Comics from using that name. It's a long story involving a ton of lawsuits, and you can learn more about it in my dedicated video on the subject. Carol was the head of security for a secret missile base, which is how she got wrapped up with Captain Marvel in the first place. This led to her having the worst day ever by being captured by one of his enemies, accidentally getting shot with an alien blaster during the rescue attempt, and then nearly dying in an explosion when a big machine blew up right next to her. Mondays, am I right? Luckily for Danvers, Captain Marvel took the bulk of the damage from the explosion, but she was still doused with obscene levels of radiation. Following this, Carol pretty much left the book entirely and wasn't seen again for years, save for a couple of minor appearances, which I guess confirms that she made a full recovery with zero side effects off screen. Just a couple of years later, Stan Lee was taking pitches for new superhero ideas, which prompted writer Jerry Conway, who had just created Power Girl for DC Comics a year prior, to step up with a simple idea. What if the radiation gave Carol Danvers powers and now she's a superhero herself? Brilliant! Jerry, you've done it again! But don't forget, I want to see Stan Lee Presents right there at the top of the first page, even though I did literally nothing to help create this book or character. This led to the creation of Ms. Marvel, and Conway took this opportunity to massively rework Danvers to better reflect the modern times, the 70s. The women's liberation movement was sweeping the nation, and one of its prominent figures, Gloria Steinem, was becoming a household name thanks to her publication, Ms. Magazine. Taking inspiration from Steinem, Jerry Conway had Carol Danvers leave the military and be hired by J. Jonah Jameson as the editor-in-chief for the Daily Bugle's newest subsidiary, Woman Magazine. Subtle. Well, maybe more subtle than how Carol just straight up looked like Steinem during this era. As for the whole superhero thing, it was revealed that Carol suffered from blackouts, wherein her body would be taken over by a completely different personality, a superpowered being who had no recollection of who she was, and was somehow able to just manifest this costume out of thin air. As far as powers go, this personality had the biology of the Kree, the alien race that Captain Marvel belonged to, and with it came super strength, durability, enhanced reflexes, and the ability to fly, basically just a souped up regular human. Decades later, though, it was revealed that Danvers is in fact half Kree herself, and the radiation simply unlocked her latent genes. I'm not a big fan of that, honestly. But anyway, the superpowered personality had an innate sense of justice and fought crime whenever she came across it. As for the name Ms. Marvel, she simply started calling herself that because her magic outfit looked like Captain Marvel's. The core of early Ms. Marvel comics was the conflict between these two identities, sort of like what we would later go on to see with Moon Knight. But here, the concept just doesn't work. But thankfully, this plot point was dropped relatively early on, when Danvers was fighting a bad gal who was like, hey, how are you lifting that big rock when you're not in your super form? And Carol was like, holy shit, you're right, that's awesome. 
So then Carol hugged the chick that she was just trying to beat the crap out of three seconds ago, and as a result of this revelation, her personas were now instantly consolidated into one identity because comics. But hey, at least Danvers got a cool new costume to help drive home the point that she was now entering a new era of her superhero career, and this costume is iconic. Ms. Marvel would go on to become a member of the Avengers, but that was cut short by her... Do we really have to talk about Avengers 200? We'll be the first ones to admit that it wasn't our finest moment, but Avengers number 200 is important for Carol's history as Ms. Marvel, so if you want to be thorough, you're gonna have to talk about it. Great. So there's this guy named Marcus, and he lives in a dimension called Limbo. Marcus used his technology to watch Carol from a distance and fell in love with her. So Marcus kidnaps her, brainwashes her, impregnates her with himself, wipes her memories, and sends her back to Earth in order for Carol to give birth to him. See, Marcus can't survive on Earth without being born there. So this whole debacle resulted in Danvers going through an entire nine-month pregnancy within the span of just a couple of weeks, giving birth to Marcus, who then immediately hyperages. Then he brainwashes Carol again, and with the full blessing of the Avengers, kidnaps her back to Limbo, where he proceeds to her body and mind until he hyperages further because he's out of sync with Limbo's rhythm, which finally broke Carol free from his mind control, and then she came back to Earth. Hey, David Michelini, I, I like that you made Venom and everything, but what the actual f is this storyline? As soon as Carol returned back to Earth, she was attacked by the villainous rogue, who absorbed so much of her life force that Danvers lost her powers entirely. This brought an end to her days as Miss Marvel, and Carol instead became the X-Men's pilot. However, during an adventure in space, Danvers was captured by some aliens who blasted her with some sort of evolution ray because comics. This beam not only brought back Carol's powers, but also unlocked her full potential, kind of like Dragon Ball Z. This is Carol's binary form, an absurdly powerful mode that allows her to absorb and manipulate energy on a massive scale, giving her cosmic level strength. But when the X-Men revealed that they were letting the newly reformed Rogue join their team, Carol was so pissed off that she straight up left Earth and then went to space to join a gang of pirates called the Starjammer. Now, we will be getting back to Carol later on in the video, but while she was off in space as Binary, the Ms. Marvel name wasn't being used. Enter Sharon Ventura. So, back in the 80s, the Thing of the Fantastic Four was living in an alternate dimension where he fell in love with a warrior woman. But it turns out that pretty much everything in this world was just a construct made from Ben's subconsciousness, and she died in his arms. When he eventually returned home, the Thing was heartbroken. But by complete coincidence, he finds Sharon, who looks identical to his alternate dimension dream girl. And like a 10-year-old developing his first crush, Ben was completely unable to talk to Sharon. But when he became a big shot at the Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation, she became a huge fan of his work, allowing them to become proper friends. Well, like, kind of? Because here's the thing. Ben is a next-level simp, and despite the fact that Sharon tells him over and over again that she is not romantically interested in him, he keeps on making her uncomfortable by repeatedly bringing up his feelings. You know, that one-sided, nice-guy nonsense of zero respect for the other person's feelings that also comes along with a weird, self-pitying sense of entitlement over that person. God, it's like me back in my weird incel libertarian phase back in college. Ugh. This sense of entitlement got to a breaking point when Sharon was given the business card of a guy called the Power Broker, who promised her superhuman strength in order to join the women's division of the UCWF. The Thing was very much against this, and forbade her from contacting the Power Broker, which naturally pissed Sharon off, and she underwent the treatment anyway. The Power Broker's process souped up Sharon's body to superhuman levels, but that's it. No flight, energy beams, or anything like that. But her new wrestling costume reminded some dude of Ms. Marvel, and since Carol was off in space and nobody had heard from her for months, Sharon decided to take the name for herself as her wrestling persona. Sharon and Ben had a huge falling out, but they ended up reconciling, with Ben going so far as to offer her a place with the Fantastic Four, while Reed and Sue went on vacation. However, her time as Ms. Marvel was short-lived, as on one of their missions, she was subjected to cosmic rays, and much like the thing before her, she mutated into She-Thing. In this new form, Sharon stuck around on the Fantastic Four, and she finally got together with Ben, leading to this scene. I'm sorry. But hey, you know what they say, if a girl keeps rejecting you, just wait until she turns into a giant rock monster, then she, then she has to take you. Eventually, Doctor Doom came a knockin', and offered Sharon a chance to be turned back to normal, which she of course leapt at. 
but it came at a cost. In exchange for the cure, she became Doom's spy, and now that she was back with the Fantastic Four as Ms. Marvel, complete with a new costume, she was now reporting back to their arch nemesis. Of course, this came to light, and even though Sharon turned on Doom, the damage was already done, and Ben wanted nothing to do with her. Though in revenge, Doctor Doom not only reverted Sharon back to She-Thing, but had mutated her way further than before. As this new She-Thing, Sharon mostly fell into obscurity, occasionally popping up from time to time, and usually as a villain. But what's weird is that she made an appearance back at the UCWF in her original Ms. Marvel form, with no explanation whatsoever. But then just two panels later, someone that's resembling the Thing is also competing, but it couldn't possibly be him because at this time, he was off in space with the Guardians of the Galaxy. From all of my reading, this just doesn't make sense because Sharon wasn't brought back to normal. So that gives me two theories. One, she can now revert back to human form at will with no explanation. And two, she's still She-Thing and this other female wrestler is just someone else that's taking up her old wrestling persona. But let's be real, this was most likely just an oversight by a writer who really doesn't care about continuity nearly as much as me. No one really does. Hey guys, Drake from the future here. I noticed when editing the video that the thing here is literally just a person in a thing suit. But regardless, that still doesn't answer the question of how Sharon is in her human form because she was never transformed back. But you know, gonna call out my mistakes when I make them. Now, it's worth noting that throughout Sharon's entire time as Ms. Marvel, Carol Danvers was still going by binary, but she later changed her name to Warbird before finally taking the Ms. Marvel name back for herself in 2006. 26 years after she ditched the name in 1980. Let me briefly jump forward in time because this is insane to me. Carol Danvers was only Ms. Marvel for three years, from 1977 to 1980. And when she took the name back in 2006, she only kept that name for six years because she became Captain Marvel in 2012. This means that in total, Carol Danvers was only Ms. Marvel for nine years. That means that at the time of this recording, Carol Danvers has been Captain Marvel for 10 years, which is longer than she was ever Ms. Marvel. And Kamala Khan, who got the name in 2014, she's had it for eight years, meaning that very, very soon, she will be the longest running out of any character to hold the Ms. Marvel name. But don't worry, we will be getting back to Kamala in a bit. In the meantime though, let's pick up where we left off and explore that six year period between Carol being Ms. Marvel again and Captain Marvel. Because guess what? There is another person that took up the mantle during that very, very brief window. After failing to stop an alien invasion, S.H.I.E.L.D. was dismantled, and in its place rose a new organization called Hammer, led by Norman Osborn. Yes, the Green Goblin himself is in charge of global security. As a part of this takeover, Osman obtained the legal rights to the Avengers name, which prompted him to hire a bunch of villains, dress them up as already established heroes, and then use them as a division of Hammer, which would unofficially be known as the Dark Avengers. Osborn's Ms. Marvel is Dr. Carl Sofen, better known as the villain Moonstone. She wields a Kree relic called the Moonstone, which gives her the usual enhanced strength, along with flight intangibility and light beams. She's also a former psychologist, and she uses her extensive knowledge of the human brain to manipulate others, frequently as a seductress. Despite her track record of villainy, Moonstone has dabbled in heroics from time to time as a member of the Thunderbolts, which is basically Marvel's version of the Suicide Squad. And hell, she was even the team's leader for a time. In the Dark Avengers, though, Carla was supposedly going to be Osborn's right-hand woman in the field, but she really wasn't able to do much of anything, because surprise, surprise, Norman Osborn is a complete control freak, and in most situations, he just sent out the absurdly powerful Sentry to wreck shop. This resulted in her not actually doing much of anything in the Dark Avengers series, outside of causing sexual drama as a slap in the face to Osborn. Honestly, I really wish there was more I could say about Carla in this video, because as Moonstone, she's an interesting and complex character, but her time as Ms. Marvel was cut extremely short because Hammer got shut down and the Dark Avengers were disassembled. I would love to talk about her history as Moonstone in greater detail in a future video, but this one is specifically about the Ms. Marvels, so it's time to move on. Which of course brings us to Kamala Khan. Now, Kamala is the most unique out of every Ms. Marvel because she's not an adult white woman who flies around, has super strength, and occasionally shoots energy beams. No, she's an awkward Pakistani kid who inhaled alien gas, went inside of a cocoon, and emerged as Mr. Lanky D. Gumby. 
Kamala was specifically created because Marvel wanted to expand their readership, something that they were seeing great success with due to the recent popularity of Carol Danvers taking over the Captain Marvel title, which spawned the ravenous Carol Core fan community that was spreading its influence amongst the entire comic fandom, especially on sites like Tumblr. I actually go into this in great detail in my recent video about Kamala's creation and how she ushered in the modern era of Marvel Comics. Anyway, much like her power set, Kamala isn't graceful. She's an awkward goober that's obsessed with video games, anime, comics, and fanfiction. Probably like you and me. Hell, the reason that she took the Ms. Marvel name in the first place was because when she first got her powers, she unintentionally morphed into her hero, Carol Danvers, and through a series of misunderstandings, she became known as Ms. Marvel herself. But don't worry, she totally got Carol's blessing when they eventually met up. Although Kamala was a member of the Avengers and is the leader of the Champions, Marvel's answer to the Teen Titans, most of her adventures are street level and smaller in scale. She's the hero of Jersey City, mostly serving to find runaway kids, fight gentrification, and does have the occasional space adventure where she gets an evil symbiotic suit with a mind of its own. We get it, she's the new Spider-Man. Look, normally when I do these character overviews, I try to stick to the broad strokes of who the character is, funny, awkward, interesting moments, and then also the big events that matter to the overall Marvel Universe. But Kamala comics are about small-scale personal stories. They're about feelings and interpersonal dynamics as opposed to action. I am all about the will-they-won't-they they dynamic of Kamala and her best friend Bruno. I adore the insights into her family life and the complexities of dealing with her overbearing parents and her overly religious brother. Honestly, the superheroics of Kamala's book are really just there to add complexity to her personal life, and her personal life right there is so much more important than her fighting the clone of Thomas Edison who is also mixed with a parakeet, or fighting sewer gators with Wolverine. I have literally read every single comic that Kamala has ever been in, and I would honestly recommend that you just read her books for yourself and experience the insanity that is Loki sneaking into the school dance to spike the punch. Maybe I will do some deep dive Kamala content sometime in the future, but for now, that's all I've got. And that is every Ms. Marvel ever. Hey, I read a lot of comics for this. I put a lot of work into it. If you like it, subscribe and maybe watch more videos. Maybe watch the video I did about Kamala Khan's creation and how she ushered in the modern era of Marvel Comics mentioned earlier in the video. Give that a watch or anything else, please. I, 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 could, use, I could use the clicks and the money. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new and hopefully I'll see you next time.